Hello, and welcome to Data and Society's Generative AI and Labor Impact Series. Um, my name is Ai Hanuin. I'm the Labor Futures Program Director at Data and Society. Uh, this is the first of three conversations on that top this topic. Today's discussion will be focused on hierarchy. I will be your host with support from CJ, Landau Brody, and Tunika Onekikami from our events team. I want to also acknowledge the support of the Ford Foundation. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. This year, Data and Society is turning 10, and I'm excited to be celebrating the anniversary with this event. You can learn more about, about what we're, we've accomplished and what, where we're headed on our website, datasociety.net. We've curated these series in response to questions we received about Data and Society's thoughts on generative AI and its potential impacts on workers and the workforce. Amidst the flurry of hearings, opinions, and debates about this topic, there's been scant discussion about actual experiences, and we are early in our research about this emerging technology. Thus, the series was born with the aim of shifting the focus towards those who are already doing this work, those not being heard yet, and those most impacted. These are exploratory discussions to reorient the debate and share concrete experiences and evidence to date, and to map powerful opportunities for workers in this space. Today's first of three discussions is meant to give us a better understanding of what led to this moment and what invisible systems and hierarchies are scaffolding the current situation and what might be coming next. Uh, during our discussion, we'll use the chat function to post links and ask you to share your experiences. To ask or upvote questions for us, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have set aside time at the end of the discussion to address those. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our speakers, writer and filmmaker John Lopez, sociologist and computer scientist Mila Michelli, and rest of world tech editor Russell Random. Thank you for joining us today. You can learn more about our speakers, the link in the chat. So to kick us off, I'd like to start with Mila and I'll first like to introduce it. her. Mila leads the research group Data, Algorithmic Systems and Ethics at the Weizenbaum Institute. She's also an associate researcher with the Distributed AI Research Institute, DARE. Mila's research is focused on labor conditions and power asymmetries in the outsourced data work, um, examining their impact on machine learning data sets. With a background in ethnographic fieldwork, interviews, and workshops with data workers globally, she actively engages communities of precaritized data workers from the global south, which makes her the perfect person to start off our discussion by, um, please, if Mila, you could answer, what does it take for this technology to exist? What type of data was needed and who provided that data? Thank you so much, Aija, and everyone uh, for producing this this event. I'm I'm very very excited to be here. So, um, to the question, what does it take? So, there is a there's a short answer and a longer one. So I will start with the short one. Of course, what it takes is computer power. That's what everyone is nowadays talking about. But also far less popular, it takes a lot a lot of data, and that's data that belongs to all of us, as all, um, and also also less popular than computer computing power and algorithms is the labor that goes into producing that data. That is uh, mostly badly paid or plain, plainly unpaid labor uh, that goes into producing the data that uh, fuels AI systems, but especially generative AI. And I want to um, highlight this, the relationship between uh, data and labor, because as I said before, producing data takes a lot of work. Uh, it's not just something that lays around and we just can just have data, um, uh, regardless of what they uh, tell us. Um, and uh, the, the labor that goes into into uh, AI is the the work of many tech workers, uh, the work of the modelers that produce uh, uh, that that come up with algorithms and that uh, you know uh, make them work, but also the work of what we call data workers. That is uh, the, the the workers who actually produce the training data that will feed uh, and and make those algorithms uh, work and make the models uh, work. Um, 
And also, I want to highlight that we all are, in a way, data workers, because many of us, uh, I'm thinking of people like John, who will uh, probably uh, speak later, but people like writers, artists, you know, whose work is actually taken to produce data, but also we, I'm not a writer, I'm not a, uh, uh, an artist, but also, you know, pictures of me are probably populating uh, uh, or serving as training data for uh, AI systems that are, are out in the world, or every time I have done a recaptcha quiz, I have served to uh, as a data worker to uh, label data uh, for AI systems. Um, and then we have, you know, large scale uh, type of data work with workers that are, are, are mostly outsourced, what we what others have called micro work, both work, uh, crowdsourcing, and so on. Um, workers uh, who are paid only, uh, who are paid per piece and only a few cents per piece, who work under very precarious labor conditions with no uh, uh, type of, with no security as we know it from other uh, more traditional type of employment relationships. Um, uh, and also working within work structures and workflows that are designed to keep them obedient and dependent on the jobs. So you know, jobs that only pay enough to make these workers, you know, make to, to make ends meet, um, but not enough for, for them to get out of poverty, just, you know, enough to, to you know, yeah, have enough to for, for, for the urgent needs uh, that one might ha may have, but nothing more. Uh, and also obedient because, you know, task instructions and the workflows and the hierarchies, since we are talking about hierarchies today, are designed uh, for these workers uh, to obey, to do what the requesters want um, uh, or be out of, of work. And also a note on this, on the question of hierarchies, also within the work that goes into producing um, AI systems, um, so what we know as AI uh, work, um, there are hierarchies because if you think of the work of the modelers, the people you know who uh, sit in tech companies who are uh, in charge of um, you know generating this what we think that are groundbreaking algorithms, we tend to glamorize that type of work. We tend to think of them as geniuses, people who do you know who are engineers who have these very important jobs. Also, the reality is that they are paid. Uh, much more than data workers. And when we think of data workers, we talk about low skill uh, workers, we talk about blue collar jobs, um, words, even words like micro work as if the work of data workers were uh, was small, you know, micro. Um, so there's also this hierarchy there. Uh, but the reality is that without the data workers, without this workforce that is available in, 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 uh, at scale and also also worth mentioning at low prices, uh, we wouldn't have the advancements in in a in the AI industry that were possible up until today, um, because yeah, you know, a large amount of data needs also requ requires that type of labor. And finally, one thing that I want to say is that. Uh, also within data work, things that are shifting. So one way of looking at it is the task instructions. We have done uh, studies on task instructions uh, past years, and now we are doing another one. And there's a, a very obvious shift in the type of tasks that are requested from data work uh, from data workers, and also the type of data workers that are on demand. So before we had uh, people who would just be trained by the AI companies to do um, to do uh, labeling tasks on images um, or to generate data like upload your selfie, upload a picture of, you know, I don't know, your bed or your kitchen. And now we see much more demand for professionals. And I'm talking about uh, uh, professional writers like fiction writers, journalists, artists. Um, and uh, for the reasons of that development, um, uh, I think I can I can probably name three. Uh, one is a shift of, you know, the type of technologies that are being created today, and with the 
um, and with the appearance of of or with the with uh, now with the development of uh, generative AI, there is a need for producing high quality data for more specific purposes, uh, for more specific contexts, also in more specific languages because technologies don't perform in the same way in English than in the way that they do in other languages. So there is a way of so there is a need to for expanding or for perfecting technologies so that they would work um, uh, hopefully uh, in the same way in English and in low resource languages. Um, but also, you know, um, there's there's the need to reducing the, the type of work that goes into classifying and moderating content uh, down the line. So, you know, if you have, if you train your model on on the large car garbage dump than the internet that that is the internet then you need to have a large workforce moderating that to avoid you know toxicity um taking out all the content that is not suitable to be used as training data whereas when you produce uh data specifically to train your model then um then uh you reduce that type of you know moderating uh, work down the line. And finally, and I think this is key, uh, creating data for specific purposes. And this is where the journalists, the writers, and the artists come into play. Um, it is helping, or I think the, the, the real reason is that companies are trying to circumvent uh, criticisms around um, copyright infringement. So, you know, um, when you have generative AI, and that's the, the thing that everyone is talking about, how the, the work of many artists and many writers has been taken uh, to train these, these systems. Now, if you have those art, if you pay those, those artists and those writers to create data to train your model, then you own that data um, and you can circumvent that type of criticism. So a lot of information in one question, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for providing that. Um, I think maybe uh, maybe this is a question that could be for you or for Russell, um, but it seems like you're talking about a shift in the type of work that's being done. So I, a related question is like, where is this work being done and has the workforce itself changed? And um, let me just take a moment to introduce Russell and then maybe, you know, either one of you can can sort of talk about that question. But um, Russell Brandom, welcome to the conversation, is a U.S. tech editor at Rust of World, where he writes the in, where he also writes the weekly exporter newsletter. And he also has years of experience covering technology at The Verge, BuzzFeed and the and the all. So I guess uh, my question is you know, has has the workforce changed? And then the question when that's related is, why is it change? Is the business or economic, uh, the economic or business structure that allows for this technology to scale, is that changing? And is that why the jobs are changing or where the, the work is changing? So maybe um, I'll start with Russell, if you can answer that. And then if Mila, if you wanna add, contribute, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I might have a frustrating answer. I don't actually think it's, I think in some ways this is a workforce that is older than AI. I would say, um, you know, you'll see a lot of, so so specifically the, they say micro work, the, the folks who are doing these small tasks, uh, and but a lot of them uh, that sort of help train the AI and, and fix mistakes, that they're doing it for the same companies, that is the same companies are subcontracting with the AI companies that they would subcontract with if this was a moderation issue, or if this was, you know, we want to spend, we like, we want to save money on our call center employees. These are, you know, I think what 20 years ago we would have called outsourcing companies. Uh, and, you know, the worker's experience is very much going to work in an office, you know, if, if they're lucky enough to actually have an office that they go to, it's very similar to, it's just that their boss is telling them to do a different thing, but it's sort of in the same building. I think the difference is there are more of those workers not, you know, doing it in buildings uh, where it's sort of, we're just putting it on the internet and we'll send people five cents per task. But I think that's really the low end of the spectrum increasingly you know as more money and more attention is poured into ai they're willing to have an actual contract for a reliable sort of workforce where you know the person is at least skilled in doing these tasks um 
But I think that's a trend that we've seen sort of more and more of the work being done by subcontractors, by by outsourcing, uh, sort of unbroken for the last 20 years. And this is kind of just a lot of the AIs doing, well, a lot of the AI work is happening that way because AI is the new thing. Can you can you expand a little bit and explain what are these companies that you're referring to? Because I'm assuming you're not talking about, well, we know Google and Facebook and OpenAI are the the ones that are creating the technology, but are these the are they the ones actually hiring or 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 managing the workforce that you're referring to? Yeah, so I would say um, I don't uh, cognizant is one example. They were a moderation subcontractor for Facebook within the U.S. Um, they manage a global workforce that is available for data annotation. Um, Modurel is another one. It's actually another Facebook subcontractor for moderation. They were based in Africa. Um, they sort of, they are also, any of these companies, once they've built the capacity to deliver a lot of labor on demand, they'll say, look, if you want to hire us for moderation, we can do that. If you want to hire us to answer phones, we can do that. If you want to hire us to train AI, we can do that. Um, and so, you know, basically we're seeing the big companies tap into that. I think, um, yeah, we could, we could go down the list of all of them, but it, it is basically the big outsourcing companies. Thank you. Mila, did you, I saw you nodding. Did you want to contribute anything to that, uh, to the discussion? Um, I think I've said a lot already, but uh, I just wanted to to um, to second what Russell was saying. It is it is actually a continuation of what we know of all older industries like uh, call centers and so on. So the outsourcing industry and actually a lot of what's going on right now, we tend to talk a lot about data work happening in platforms. Uh, like Amazon Mechanical Turk and many others that are similar. But there is a, a very, very large uh, industry that is related to BPOs, business process outsourcing companies, uh, having an important, very, very important role in this place, uh, in this space, like Sama, for example, in Africa um, and, and many others. Um, the maybe Maybe one thing is the, maybe one important difference is that the workers that work at the BPO and are related to the to what we know as data work that also inc includes content moderation um, are trained specifically for that purpose and they receive a very specific type of training and even within that uh, within those those type of tasks and jobs, there are hierarchies. So there are also what is known as uh, subject matter experts that are hired specifically to intervene in specific in annotation, for example, for specific domains. Like for example, medical uh, medical students uh, intervening and doing uh, data labeling for um, medical imagery, for example, and treated and paid as experts as different, which is different from the other workers. Mm, that's an interesting um, development to see. I guess we hadn't really heard much about that. So um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, Russell, can I ask you a follow-up question about uh, who, what has been a success case or, or um, a successful use of of generative AI programming that you've seen. Um, we talked about the supply chain of data. So now there are companies that are actually integrating a lot of AI into pretty much everything. There's AI in the Zoom, which by the way, we do not have on, but um, it's so many other spaces. Is what are actual um, useful and um, successful examples that you've seen in your, in your understanding? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two. So one of the early ones, and I think of this sort of before a lot of the recent OpenAI hype, GitHub had been quietly offering Copilot, which was sort of almost an autofill for programming. Uh, because GitHub has this enormous sort of, uh, you know, library of programming, and there are a lot of patterns. And so, you know, it was not something that you would want to just let you, you know, to just write the program for you, but it could take a first pass. And these things have to go through so much review anyway, that a lot of, there were already a lot of eyeballs on everything to catch the differences. 
Uh, but, you know, their early numbers, they were saying, oh, people are going, people can do 20% more because there's this. Who knows? But a lot of people did find it to be useful enough to be worth paying for. Um, the other one I would say, and I think this is a bit more, we don't know if it's useful yet. But so the same, Microsoft owns GitHub, the same company, you know, they their main, main product is Windows and Office. That's sweet. Um they, in the most recent version, said, okay, we're going to integrate Copilot into this. So it can listen into your Teams meeting and, you know, automatically generate a transcript, summarize that transcript, and put it in email. And then it can, you know, look at the email and summarize a list of issues for your next meeting. Basically, this is sort of automating white-collar middle management. Um, and I do, part of me thinks... If we're able to do, like, each middle manager is able to do three times as much of that, do we actually see a more productive company result? Or is there just more, like, busy work and more meetings and emails because we can summarize them that much faster? Um, I don't know. I think that, that one's a little bit up in the air still. Thank you. That's very interesting. As someone who studies algorithmic management, a lot of what we've seen is those technologies also sort of automate management responsibilities. So there's an interesting connection between these two technologies. Um, so I kind of, I want to bring John into the conversation. So we asked, you know, this is a, this is a, a case of when generative AI has been used um, somewhat in theory effectively, depends on who you ask. Uh, but there was early on a statement that this was really going to be a wonderful tool for creators, um, writers, artists, um, can you uh, tell us, you know, how you whether you agree with that, how you see the success of the tool, or how it's been um, integrated into uh, your work and your industry? And um, I'll have some follow up questions after that, but I'll start with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it remains to be seen. I'm a little bit skeptical. You know, the thing that has been uh, problematic about AI is the use of uh, copyrighted material and intellectual IP. Uh, in the training data, you know, when you look at these programs, when you look at Bard or Claude or ChatGPT, you know, the bulk of the the data is the training data, you know, kind of transmuted and compressed into the training weights. So for us as writers, I think it was more concerned that we would find ourselves um, as we use it, you know, we we were afraid it was going to be used kind of as a way to worsen our employment conditions um and basically underpay writers you know that we uh, on the ai working group we kind of came together before the strikes of last year and we did a whole bunch of research because chat gpt had come out and it was somewhat new you know i played with gpt3 a little bit before that which is kind of how i got into the working group um and what we did once we started to mess around with it is we noticed that it would output like very similar plagiaristic style content and this is very problematic because as a screenwriter, you're familiar with a lot of other things. And so you're trying not to plagiarize someone else usually, or you're trying not to kind of like, you know, go into those problematic areas. So, you know, when we were in the working group, one of the first things we noticed is we were able to get it to reproduce a page from the Godfather screenplay pretty easily. Um, and then you know, we were in the middle of the group when GPT-4 <clears throat> came out. And just because I wanted to be familiar with this technology, I signed up for it that first day. And I wanted to see just how fast could I write a script? Like, oh, is this going to make me write a script so much faster? Um, which is problematic because it, I think the equation then becomes for the studios to devalue the writer's work and see if they can pay people less than their going rates. And what I found is as I wrote, literally, I was in a writer's room for a show. Uh, they had the announcement on my lunch break. I signed up for GPT-4 and I was like, all right, can I write a full 30 page script on my lunch break, which is something that would be incredible if you could do it. But as I did that, I noticed more and more the script output came to resemble ALF. I came up with a concept. And I'm like, write me a, a show about an alien hiding on Earth with humans and slowly, as a half hour sitcom, and slowly more and more and more, it became just Elf with different names. There was even a point where it started talking about eating cats, which if you've seen Elf, you know, that's basically like one of the hallmarks of Elf. And I was like, whoa, this thing tends to bend you towards plagiarism. It tends to bend you towards repeating someone else's work, which is really something we as screeners try to avoid. 
So what we saw was something that was very problematic. We also knew that it had been trained on copyrighted material, stuff that uh, you know we think view as copyright infringement. Um, and we also known that it was being used to mimic our voices and styles as writers, which is very problematic. Um, you know, in the early days, people would, one of the ways to make GPT write better was to say, write something in the style of Stephen King, write something in the style of George R. R. Martin. And now you're seeing these lawsuits from authors like George R. R. Martin. And then obviously the New York Times lawsuit that happened over the holidays. And so this was all very problematic. And I think when we went on strike, we were concerned that, you know, this would be an excuse for studios to pay us less for writing because they suddenly, you know, if you very naively think of writing as the act of typing, which it's not, which we as screenwriters don't feel that it just is, you know, it's like, oh, you can just output a script now very fast. So it should cost less. But honestly, the scripts that it outputs aren't very usable and you have to go in and rewrite it. So, you know, our fears were that uh, they would underpay us and they would prevent us from sharing in the value that we create. Because again, you know, when you work for hire as a writer, you're creating intellectual property, you're creating stuff that is, you know, obviously, everyone's inspired by things, but you're creating something that is unique, that is transformative, that is your own, you're kind of like merging your own personal point of view as an artist, as a writer, into a work that then gets merged with all the voices of all the other collaborators to make the TV shows that we love. And what it felt like this technology was doing was kind of recycling and regurgitating past work in a way that kind of like um, obfuscates attribution, obfuscates prominence, you know, a provenance. Um, and we got very concerned about that. So, you know, we went in during the strike, we tried to have a conversation. And at first, the the employers were initially unwilling to talk about it with us. They kind of didn't want to like regulate it. And we thought, well, we're, we're the writers, you know, we make our living by kind of like putting our heart and our soul into what one person might call training data, we call creative expression, you know, and that's something that's very personal. It's very unique to us. Um, eventually it took us 148 days, but we got uh, a lot of provisions that we felt were necessary to exist in a world where AI is now kind of everywhere. Um, and the basic, most basic level are our new provisions in our contract that just went to uh, enforcement are that, you know, AI is not a writer. When you're doing a creative work, it has to go through a human being. Um, and the material it generates can't be used as an excuse to affect a writer's pay or credit. You can't write, pay someone less because you started with an AI script. You know, that was, I think that was one of the biggest loopholes we were concerned about for our particular instance is that it used to be the human just generated the script, right? And there are different pay levels. If you generate an original script, if you're adapting material uh, that the studio has underlying rights to, there's slightly different pay structures. But then instantly in the working group, we thought, oh, okay. Well, now any executive can just whip up a script over lunch, a 60 page, very bad script, and then pay us the rewrite rate, which is a much lower rate. But really, the work is the same amount of work because rewriting a bad script in Hollywood can often be a page one job where you're just writing again. Um, and in particular with AI, because it kind of bends towards the average and the cliche, it actually can make your job a little bit harder. It can kind of reduce the quality of the work. So we got um, we got a lot of these protections in our contract. It took a lot. It, it took a strike, honestly. It took us walking for 148 days. It took SAG walking with us. It took a lot of public pressure and you know people on the lines. They were very fearful because all the kind of hype and hullabaloo coming out of Silicon Valley was like, oh, writers are candle makers now. You're going to replace them. We don't need them anymore. Who needs horses in a world with cars? You know. I think that's a little delusional and naive, but uh, we had to kind of prove our worth. And it was a, a lot harder struggle than I think we thought. But we got most of what we wanted. The final thing we wanted, because we we realized that the value of AI systems comes from their training data, is we wanted restrictions on whether or not our training data could be used to train future AI models. And we know already that these uh, the big companies, Google, Facebook, Meta, um, ChatGPT, you know, OpenAI, we know they've already kind of basically without even trying to ask or license it have ripped off copyrighted material we know it's in their training data set um they don't want to disclose that um but we're saying that shouldn't be allowed that should be something that's up to the individual writer or artist and this is something that doesn't just affect artists uh, writers it affects like visual artists you know they don't even have a union that can fight for them on this level of saying oh you know your stuff was ingested into an ai without compensation consultation or consent that's not right 
you know, if you're trying and now open AI and all these other places, if they kind of realize what they did was wrong and they're kind of bending and they're saying, oh, well, we'll give you an opt out if you don't want your stuff in the training data. A, it's too late. The model already, the training data is in there. It's in the training weights. B, an opt out is not something that you can put on an individual artist or creative or writer or worker. It has to be opt in. You have to come to them and negotiate that in a fair market way. And we're basic. So we tried to get something that would kind of approach that with the studios. We didn't quite get that. We basically said, all right, we're going to agree to disagree. And we're going to kind of further our protection of individual creatives work as training data. We're going to try and find, you know, advocacy in the courts, in legislation, and just in general in society, that this is something that has to be opt in that, you know, if a writer is going to like upload their entire over of work, uh, they're going to get paid for it and get paid uh, an appropriate weight, uh, rate for that work, which is, from my understanding, quite valuable. You know, as 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 we've seen over the years, it seems like there was this, you know, in the early days of AI, it's this indiscriminate scraping of the internet. And I guess there's an old data science algorithm, uh, data science saying that someone told me, so if, I apologize if I get it wrong. It's like junk in, junk out. Like the quality of the training data matters. Um, and that's our job is to produce high quality training data. You know, you may not like particular scripts or movies that we've written and listen, man, it's a, it's a crazy process, but it is quality. We put a lot of thought into it. There's a lot of effort that goes into it and the stuff that doesn't get produced, you know, you should see that. Um, so that level of quality and protection of that quality was something that we felt we needed to, um, we will need to do ongoing work for, uh, basically making sure that that right to train is something that really redounds to the individual artist. You know, unfortunately we have the WGA, we have a guild that will fight for laborers. Um, and I just wish other artists had a similar guild. You know, I wish visual artists had that. I think, I think there's definitely a movement towards, you know, building that solidarity. I think two things that you, I want to highlight two things you brought out. One was that I think a lot of people are saying this is a labor saving tool, but what you just said actually yeah. makes me believe it's not, doesn't save labor at all. So yeah, not in, not on a creative level. I, I don't listen. Like I said, I, I want to open up to others to also uh, answer that. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. But, um, you know, let's challenge that. Anyone on the call, please. <laughs> yeah, please jump in. But starting with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. With me. Well, I'll say, yeah, I, I I would hear from a lot of like, you know, as part of the working group, I we I would go up and talk to people in the world of AI and they'd kind of brag, we've solved the blank page problem. And I'm like, that's not really the problem. The blank page is the point. You're trying to figure out what you want to say. You're trying to figure out what you want to express, you know, and honestly, the process of writing, the process of discovery really helps you do that. So to kind of start with kind of an average random normalized cliched thing that doesn't really have a point of view and doesn't express anything specific and is kind of more like spam than anything that I, sometimes it makes the job harder so on a creative level i'm not sure how much uh time it really does save and so far the the best use case i've seen personally for the uh the chat bots at least is they seem to have increased the level of spam in the world which is like text that no one actually wants to read you know i saw this this tweet um by someone on Twitter and it is, this is not, these are not my words because I would want to attribute that. Uh, I forget who it was. They basically said, why would I want to be bothered to read something someone couldn't be bothered to write? And I think when it comes to creative work, that's kind of the point. Thank you. Others? I know Russell. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so there's like a time honored uh, Silicon Valley tradition of, you kind of make a thing and you have lots of ideas for how it could be used and then you sort of see what sticks. Um, and and I think uh, we don't associate the tech industry with humility, but I think there is a, a sort of humility to it where it's like, well, we don't know what this will actually be good for. And I think AI is particularly true of that, or that is particularly true of AI. Um, we don't really know. And, and I think the people making it don't really know what it will be good for. I think we saw... You know, a year ago, people were very, very bullish on image generators. And I think in the past year, we've seen the style actually turns out to be pretty specific. And once you've seen a few of these, it's not exciting anymore. It's you you lose that. I can't believe an AI did this. And it becomes just sort of a bad, a bad image. Um, the places where it will be used 
kind of by definition will be labor saving places because if it is making you more labor, people will eventually catch on and stop using it. Um, so, I mean, there's that. I think the question is sort of will, are there any of those places, right? Um, which we're still sort of muddling through. But I mean, that's also part of why it's such a nervous making place for, for folks like John and that that's sort of, we don't really know what the threat is going to be to workers yet. Well, and I would say one thing that it's not nervous, but kind of like frustrating, aggravating is the way these models were assembled by taking copyrighted material without permission or con like to us, that's theft. That's not fair use. You know, a lot of these companies, I think, kind of argued a, a knee jerk fair use defense because they wanted to build it. They were going to ask forgiveness rather than permission because if they ask permission you get into a licensing regime you know that's how music licensing works and like in film like when you want to use a someone else's song to, on your tv show you have to strike a deal with them you have to pay them for that and you get a, a defined percentage of how much of that song you're using for what period of time and there are whole laws and it actually kind of works you know that's another revenue stream for musicians that uh, it still exists even though you know when you're um you know, the streaming Spotify movement is kind of screwed over the middle class mus musician. Like they can still do that. Now you're seeing open AI kind of belatedly go out and try and strike deals with the Associated Press. And the New York Times lawsuit seems to have resulted from the fact that they went in with a very low ball offer. The New York Times is like, wait, you know, we represent a massive amount of your training data. You're competing directly with what we do, which is provide news to society. And you're just going to spit it out without attribution. And you only want to pay us, I think, rumored in the press, like $5 million to use all of our stuff as training data. That doesn't make sense. And, you know, then you saw the lawsuit where they literally the outputs were plagiarizing massive segments of New York Times articles. So that's Thank a problem. You. That's a real problem for us as creatives, not just for journalists. Thank you. Um, I neglected to introduce uh, John fully <laughs> before he started speaking. So I'll do it now because I think his uh, body of work is impressive and we should know. Um, John Lopez got to start working in feature film production before covering entertainment and the arts for Vanity Fair, LA Times and Business Week. Um, he's an alum of the CBS Writers Mentoring Program and the Sundance Episodic Lab. And he has written and produced for such shows as Strange Angel, seven seconds, the man who fell from earth and the terminal list. And uh, as he mentioned in the run-up to the WGA's contract negotiations, he also served as a member of the Guild's AI working group. Um, I have one last, we have a ton of great questions coming in both from the chat and the Q&A, but I did wanna ask um, one question from all of you, which is first of all, thank you so much for your great expertise and your insights on this topic. Who else should we be listening? If each of you can go through and list one or two, or if you have more people, who else should we be listening to who um, has good insights on this topic? I'll start first, just because I have it off the top of my head. Um, and they just published this paper. So on, on the heels of the New York Times um, lawsuit, over the holidays, Gary Marcus, a cognitive neuroscientist and kind of expert in AI, he testified before Congress. He teamed up with this concept artist, Reed Southern, who has done a lot of concept art for studios. And I kind of want to shout them both out because um, they put together a work of image generators, a, a kind of like a, a paper that showed how image generators just, you know, like rip off wholesale copyrighted images. Like if you can, you can ask them to output like golden droid and it comes out with something that looks like C-3PO. And they went through and they exhaustively showed how Midjourney does that. And for Reed in particular, I think he's very articulate for the plight of concept artists because they're being impacted right now like what we were afraid was going to happen to writers uh tv writers and film writers is kind of ha is happening to concept artists and reed has been talking you know if you read his twitter feed he'll talk about people who are no longer getting paid their rates who are being forced to compete with their own material um again material that was taken and put into these ai models that these companies then charge for as a replacement for Reed himself and so he wants to advocate that and he also wants to show how the outputs of these image generators are highly derivative and plagiaristic and how that's a problem and that these artists should be compensated, they should be consulted and they should have a say. So those those two just did this paper that I, I forget where it was published, but it was really great. And I think Reed has been very vocal. Uh, Carla Ortiz is also leading a lawsuit for the image generator. So I, I wanna shout them out precisely because these artists do don't have unions. 
And as laborers, they kind of work freelance gig to gig. And I feel like they're some of the most precarious, but also most uh, beautiful, creative people who, who their voice needs to be heard and amplified. Um, you know, we have the WGA. I, I can come and give, a, you know, a talk here and other members of the WGA talk about it, about this stuff, but they don't really have a union. And I, I really wish they did. Thank you. I want to echo what Joan was saying, like same people, shout out to them. Um, and also expand that into really listening to generally the people, the workers who produce data, uh, because they have great insights into, um, and this brings me to also one of the questions in the chat, into the labor supply chain. Uh, and also they are great in giving us um, I don't know, key information to demand accountability. And I think what John was telling us before um, in terms of the guild and in terms of the, the what comes for with organizing and with demanding uh, better conditions, also what it does to the, or what it, what it brings to the general public in terms of information, in terms of us knowing and demanding accountability. But that's the work, that, that's, that's what workers are, uh, also the power that workers have not only to you know demand better conditions for themselves but also for us uh general uh people who might not be part of these supply chains uh to know more and we wouldn't know that without uh, uh if it was not for whistleblowers and people within these companies who actually are brave enough to speak up organize uh and demand um, so in general, uh, really listen to the workers, workers, uh, the, the data workers. And with that, I expand also to, to the people doing creating a creative work whose, uh, work is being, is, is being used to train AI systems. Uh, they need also to be heard more when it comes to, um, regulation discussions. So, you know, when it comes to regulation, people like Sam Oldman and all the big shots, they are being heard all over Europe and all over the, the US, uh, but nobody sits with data workers or with creative uh, writers or uh, with artists and listens to them, to what they have to say about their work and about, their, uh, about the conditions in which data is produced. So I think uh, that's very important and you would be surprised and many people don't think of data workers in that way because again we tend to think of them as low skill whatever laborers contractors um they have a lot a lot of thoughts in terms of ai ethics in terms of uh what is right and what is wrong they have a lot of concerns in terms of the data that they get to label and to view and review um and yeah, but nobody's listening to them. Nobody's giving them a platform. So I think that's a key group to listen to. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, everything John and Mila have said. Uh, I would add uh, Joy Bulamwini, uh, who's with the Algorithmic Justice League and has been doing a ton of stuff, uh, has a new book out, Unmasking AI. Um, she's, I, I became aware of her as part of the the sort of, bias in algorithms discussion. Uh, and I think one of the tricks we've seen the sort of current AI industry play is completely removing that whole discussion from AI. These are basically algorithms. I think the bias question is still a huge problem. Um, and also a kind of window into the real limitations of what these these machines can do um so yeah i would a uh, big fan of her work and uh yeah a great perspective on these issues and i just want to jump in to set something russell and Miller are pointing to which is the data laborers themselves like in their raw form these models they're very toxic they're kind of like if you could talk to an unfine-tuned unhuman trained uh chat gbt it would be a crazy experience you know, we saw a little bit of that, I think it was a year ago when Kevin Roos was uh, broke Bing and got it to reveal that it was Sydney and it tried to make him break up with his wife. You know, that kind of crazy, freewheeling, kind of scary stuff. Like that's kind of what these things come out with in the raw form. But what really made AI models like ChatGPT more useful, if, if they are useful, um, is that re RLHF, reinforcement learning through human feedback. And that's what these data workers are doing. You know, they're their the value of their ip in a weird way 
is going into making these things more coherent than they naturally are. You know, just as like you need, there's a lot of junk in the internet. And so if you just randomly queried an LLM with your prompt, you might get some unusable stuff. In order to circumvent that, you have to train it through these, you know, workers in the global South. P again, people who don't necessarily have uh, unions who deserve protections and a living wage and who deserve to be valued for their work. It is, it's incredibly value, valuable work to to kind of fine tune and retrain these models to give them that uh, 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 look of humanity, which they don't really have because they're not human. Thank you all. Those were great. Uh, I, I feel like we were developing a great resource in the chat as well as other people um, pr present their options and their recommendations as well. Um, I think we have time for a couple questions. We have a ton of questions <laughs> in the Q&A and I'm trying to uh, look at which ones have been upvoted. Um, so it looks like a couple of them are very similar. So maybe we can start with this one. What are some ways users can demand accountability and visibility into the labor supply chain? And I think that's related to a question about how people concerned with labor issues and AI um, can better work with labor leaders or unions, particularly in areas in the US where there, um, there aren't um, unions um, to kind of shape the a different outcome or improve the outcomes for workers that benefit workers in this space. Um, I'll go, I'll go first just because there's one thing I know off the top of my head, data transparency. That's another big kind of principle. I think in the WGA we've started to come to realize is important. You know, we know that these uh, LLMs and these other image generators are trained on copyrighted work because of investigative reporting um, journalists, but like OpenAI, Google Meta, they, they haven't, I think Meta finally disclosed that it's training on copyrighted work, but they haven't really disclosed what's in the data sets and where it comes from. And it kind of admitted to the provenance. Now they might have to do that um, as a result of the New York Times lawsuit, who knows, maybe in discovery, they'll have to do that. But I think legally, what was interesting about the US's approach to AI regulation was that we didn't have that data transparency uh, request out of what I saw in the uh, executive order, whereas in Europe they did. So I think maybe this is something that you go to your congressman, you go to your representatives and you say, we need data transparency because it's not just like an IP issue. It's also an us issue. The data is our data. Like they scrape the internet. So like, who knows what about you is in these data sets? Who knows what images of you or your family or your person? Like there have been uh, cases of LLMs accidentally leaking private medical data. Like we need to know that data transparency before we can even coherently figure out how to regulate this and make this safe for people to get whatever benefit there might be from it. And we don't have that now. And I think there needs to be like a public outcry saying, I want to know what's in the data sets. You can't build this gigantic thing that you say is going to change the world and make you a lot of money without disclosing what it is built from. That's one thing. Yeah, I think I have I have a slightly more um pessimistic spin on it. But I think I mean John John is right. That data transparency is is huge. I think I'm not sure there's a lot we can do as consumers. I think data transparency is good to push for at the legislative uh, level. Obviously, as a consumer, it's always good to sort of keep an eye on like uh, unionized shops and running boycotts. But I think part of what's weird about AI is the alienation from the people who are producing the data is built right into the system. So if you're not alienated from the people who worked on it and the people who provided the data, it's not really AI. At that point, you're just hiring someone to write something for you, um, which is a good thing. You should do that. But I think it is, you know, we're now, I think, stumbling towards, well, okay, is there a way that we can do this ethically and we can say, okay, I'm selling you the right to use my work as training data Maybe there's an ethical way and maybe we'll find a way to do it that's ethical. But I think getting transparency into how the sausage is made is is very it's going to be a tough sell for this model. Maybe just briefly, I'm rather with Russell on, on this one. I, I think uh, transparency is such a big word. And, and then, you know, it's also the question of for whom are we seeking transparency? Because, you know, the, the, the need for information that I may have as a consumer is not the same one that uh, others might need, might, might have. And what workers need to know is not the same that, you know, like requesters need to know and so on. So 
I, th I and also I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, sadly a bit of a this um uh, a bit of a skeptic uh when it comes to you know like big solutions that have to do with you know top down type of regulation which you know it would be great if it would work in the in real world scenarios but in general those uh, solutions don't work for everyone uh, everywhere so yeah thank you that was uh, a really great response. And I think it sort of leads us to a particular direction. Um, I want to pull out a question, this one specifically for Mila. A lot of people were interested in hearing from you. Um, in the writer's strike in the US, we saw actors strike in solidarity with writers. Do you think we can expect similar solidarity from tech workers, developers, data science, et cetera, to rally with the cause of annotators? And also given that what you expressed with the sort of the work and the workers changing, is there now more space for um, really identifying and uplifting the uh, experiences and uh, of the work that annotators do? Um, so to the first question, I, um, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope, I think that would give workers huge leverage if they had the support of their colleagues who, you know, who are a little bit more fortunate in terms of having their expertise valued and being paid better and being in, in a in more stable, um, in more stable uh, employment relationship with these companies because they are the direct employees. So it is not the same to be a subcontracted worker through a platform working for Google than to be a Google employee, uh, an engineer somewhere. Um, so I certainly hope so. That would be great if the if tech workers would join uh, their less fortunate colleagues, uh, mostly in the global south, and support their demands. Um, especially to be hired as employees, to have more stable uh, employment relationships and so on. I think that that, that would be great. Um, and the second question related to uh, whether this means a shift of having workers, having their expertise uh, valued. Um, I think it is, I, I wish I could say it is because of that, that this is shifting. Of course, this is not shifting because of that. This is shifting because of economic um, uh, needs, and it's shifting because of copyright uh, demands, and you know the need to create this type of proprietary data, um, and not to have to deal with with copyright uh, infringement. Um, and I wish I could. And it's also, of course, uh, shifting because of the technical needs of more and more uh, ever more sophisticated models. Um, but it is true that it does something in terms of the visibility of, of putting out there the, the idea that data workers are experts in the data. This is not new. I mean, uh, data workers have always, and this is something I've been saying for years now, now that data workers are no low-skilled workers. They are very much experts. And I'm talking about all kinds of data workers. I'm talking about also the data workers who do um consider jobs that are considered low skill, like you know, data labeling. I um uh, I was uh, thinking about about this a uh, couple of days before uh, the first the very first time that I did field work six years ago with data workers. One of the the jobs that or the the tasks that these workers had was to label and to segment satellite imagery. And you know when you talk about that and when you think of that, it's basically if I had to describe that well, that's basically separating trees from roads, from cars, from people. And one might think, oh well, that's easy. Let me tell you, I tried that work for like one week. I couldn't get to do one picture right because of the complexity of these images, because of the type of accuracy that you need to possess to do that type of work. And also because you need to be very acquainted with specific places, with the way cars look in specific places, with the way vegeta vegetation looks in, in specific places. So it is not easy and all workers are very much experts in the data and in the craft that takes that to do data work. So I hope these developments serve the purpose of putting this uh, idea um, out there. Uh, and finally, I really hope that the fact that they uh, will be viewed, if they are, if they, they, if they get to be viewed uh, more as experts and less as low skilled workers that it translates of course in better labor conditions, more payment, uh, better wages and so on. Thank you. And thank you for that insight into how difficult it is to do some of this work and people don't under, don't get it, an insight into that 
exactly for what Russell said. It's meant to sort of distance people from uh, the the actual training of the systems. Um, we have a, a question from one um, attendee who's wondering about beliefs or assumptions about creative appreciation by audiences for content produced generative AI. How do you think readers, consumers of content appreciate are not content that is specifically generated in this way? Do they or we care? Where do audiences figure in these discussions? Sorry, could you say the question again? Because it feels like that's a question about like stories, <laughs> but I agree. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a little bit of a comp. I guess the main question is where do audiences figure in this discussion? Do they care uh, whether the creative work is um, generated or it's um, uh, original content? What are what are some beliefs or assumptions about creative ap appreciation? Yeah, I mean, I guess the cynical version is maybe audiences don't care and it's just whatever make catches our attention. And that seems to be kind of like the the operating um, principle of social media. But uh, maybe audiences should care just in the way, you know, I had this talk with someone who was part of the SAG AI stuff. It's like, yeah, you could look at it and get really depressed and say, oh, it, no one cares who makes the stuff. They just want their they just want their content or their entertainment. Um but also, you know, it's like when mass produced farming in the United States started kind of like getting really homogenized food, we all ate it and then it started to make us sick. And then people started to develop a taste for organic stuff because there was something about provenance and about uh, trusting, you know, the kind of organic nature of food or, or at least striving towards that that became more desirable. And so maybe that's something that we have to be thinking of and mindful of where our content and how our content is produced. Is there a human voice behind it? Is someone trying to tell you something? Is there, is, is it not just a story that's kind of like a statistically generated story, but something that has a human point of view. And, and I will say, obviously that doesn't apply the board across the board to like, you know, cheap throwaway imagery that you can get out of an AI generator, even though again, an artist provided the underlying training data that made that cheap throwaway imagery possible. Um, but maybe demanding that, just saying like, I'm going to do something that I know a human being touched because like, what's the point of art? I mean, this is this is for art or content or whatever. But what's the point of art if not like connecting with other human beings as opposed to the kind of like this average, mean, uh, synthetically generated uh, regurgitation of everyone's work that that only really serves to profit a random corporation that doesn't even that didn't even get the permission to use that work to begin with. Thank you. Um, do others have a quick response to that question? Uh, yeah, I would just weigh in. I mean, I think, um, you know, telling fictional stories is sort of a, a uniquely humane use of these tools. Uh, I think, like, summarizing in a meeting in an email, I think there's actually a strong case. One of the reasons I find that an interesting use case is people really I'm not sure I care how much of the person was present in writing that email. Um, and I think one of the wake up calls is how much labor in the world is like that. I, I mean, I do think that's kind of a pessimistic statement about the world before AI, but I do think that's, you know, a sobering thing to think about. Uh, and I think that's really where the opportunity for AI is. Thank you. Mila, are you, you're good without commenting? <laughs> I think I'm good. I think what my colleagues here said was a beautiful way to wrap it up. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking today's jo uh, panelists, John Lopez, Mila Michelli, and Russell Brandom. Um, we hope to see you at future conversations on this topic and remain connected. Our next one will be live streamed and held in New York City on February 8th. You can learn more and register at datasociety.net and also sign up for the update in labor and tech newsletter at the link in the chat. Thank you so much for everyone who uh, attended and also your wonderful questions. We'll try to forward those out and maybe we can uh, figure out a way to answer them well. But thank you so much, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>